Now we move from um, three really inspiring companies to some, a pair of inspiring individuals. The next segment is the local benefactor. The spirit of this award is thanks for thinking big. Please welcome Janaki Clem of TechCU to introduce. Thank you so much, Rich. And I truly am honored to be able to do this today uh, to introduce our 2019 Local Benefactor Award on behalf of Technology Credit Union. This distinction is for irrepressible vision and positive impact on society. So in reviewing our honorees' accomplishments for this introduction, it seemed almost impossible that one person could be doing all of this. From leading the Silicon Valley Leadership Group for 25 years, to raising millions for local charities, to fighting for affordable housing and transportation initiatives, and so much more. I know that this person approaches his work with an attitude of service, or true servant leadership. Sometimes servant leaders face multiple challenges where they must give of themselves over and over again, so many times that people begin to take their service for granted. Because of this, it is especially fitting to recognize him with this well-earned and very deserving award for his decades of leadership in the face of a myriad of challenges. I am proud to say, along with our honoree, Technology Credit Union cares deeply about creating the best educational opportunities for all in our innovation economy, growing our local talent to join our companies and remain in our community. We too spend a large portion of our time, treasure, and talent to help ensure that all have the ability to wholly participate in our local economy from jobs to housing to the ability to get where we need to go. It is my privilege to welcome, with great admiration and appreciation, my friend, the 2019 Local Benefactor Honoree and Superstar, Carl Guardino. <laughs> Together with his conversation partner, San Jose's Mayor, Sam Licardo. Congratulations. Oh, it oh, it's photo, photo it's off. Right, here we go. Well, it's great to be here this evening. Thank you everyone for having us. Uh, Carl, let's get right down to talking about you. Uh, in the many years in which you have served as a leader here on Silicon Valley, you have met great leaders throughout the world, throughout the country. Uh, of all your big city mayors in this country, who's your favorite? <laughs> no, 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 we don't have to answer that. So Carl, um, you have become synonymous. Your name has become with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, but it wasn't always that way. Many people might be surprised to know you actually did not found the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. You want to tell us the origin story about how the organization started? Absolutely. And first of all, I want to thank the Churchill Club and Karen Tucker and her team for putting on tonight and for, in my case, lowering your standards. To yeah. present me with this award. <laughs> It's, it's truly an honor to be here and to think that I get to share the stage with leaders of great companies like Slack and Peloton and Zoom and someone who I've admired as a mentor for years, John Thompson, who's coming up next with another mentor, Steve Lusso, who is smart enough to duck out while I'm on stage. So, <laughs> uh, we'll get Steve for He'll that when he comes yeah. back. Uh, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group was created by the legendary leader, David Packard, who pulled together Bob Noyce and Jerry Sanders and 30 other Valley visionaries at the old Ricky's Hyatt on El Camino Real in Palo Alto and said, hey, we're fierce competitors in the marketplace. But when it comes to building a better future for our economy, our employees and their families and the broader communities in which we operate, we have a lot more in common than we ever have that divides us. So let's unite around those issues where we have common ground. And at the leadership group, my main role is not to mess up David Packard's vision, <laughs> uh, but also to carry out what we call the 95-5 principle. And that is no matter, no matter how complex some of the challenges we face as a region, state, and nation, 
when you peel everything away, we probably agree on the solutions about 95% of the time. We stridently disagree about 5%. And a lot of the problem is we get so fixated on the 5% where we're never going to agree that we forget that we could be making wonderful progress for our region, state, and nation if we just focus on the 95%. And that's what we try to do. So and, it was David Packard's vision that brought us all together. And you have uh, led that organization amazingly as CEO for so many years. Why don't you just tell us how you got in? involved with SDLG, how'd you land there? Yeah, I was so impressed by David Packard and I, I was able to work there for a, a period of time for Lou Platt when he was CEO and what a great mentor uh, he was. One of my most prized possessions is an email he sent me when I departed, uh, uh, thanking me for some, some work that we had uh, done together and that he had entrusted to me. And I, I will never forget that. It's framed in my office as one of those prized possessions. Uh, but for me, what was so appealing about the leadership group uh, was something that David Packard said when he was a relatively young CEO. It was He was giving a speech to a group of older CEOs on uh, post-wartime production. And he stood in front of those colleagues, I think it was 1948, and he said, our responsibility as CEOs is as much to our employees, their families, the communities in which we do business, and our customers as it is to our shareholders. And he was able to strike that balance scale. You can't help anyone if you go out of business, so you have to be responsible to your shareholders. But those stakeholders include customers, employees, family, and community. I thought it was pretty cool when Jamie Dimon, who, who I greatly admire, J.P. Morgan Chase and the U.S. Business Roundtable came out about two weeks ago with a similar statement. And I thought, yeah, 71 years ago, that was David Packard's philosophy and the philosophy around which he built the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And that drew me uh, like, a, uh, like a fly to a flame to be a part of that. Now, we're going to talk about your work with SVLG in a minute, but um, you're also uh, well known for being associated with, of all things, a turkey trot. Uh, <laughs> and if any of you are among the 26,000 who are wearing running shoes, thank you, uh, on Thanksgiving morning and you're in downtown San Jose, maybe you're wearing a turkey outfit, uh, or maybe you're forced to wear a turkey outfit because you happen to be mayor that day. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know something about the Turkey Trot, which has raised now more than $8 million for charities serving needy families in Silicon Valley. How did you and I believe your wife, Leslie, come up with that idea? You know, it's funny. In life, we meet two kinds of people, right? We meet uh, talkers and takers, and we meet doers and donors. And it was Thanksgiving morning, 2004. The alarm went off. KCBS radio uh, came on, and uh, the announcer was talking about 20,000 people downtown running and walking to help support the hungry. But here's the kicker. He wasn't talking about rich Silicon Valley. He was talking about Sacramento and their run to feed the hungry. And I turned to my wife um, and said, you know, somebody ought to do that here. And she gave me that famous Leslie look that said, well, maybe that ought to be you, fella. <laughs> and so we uh, reached out to our friends at Applied Materials and uh, just some visionary leaders there who care deeply about the community, and they believed in the vision. And so we had one year to put together a race. We'd been marathoners and, and Ironman triathletes for years, but that was the talker and taker part. We'd never been on the doer and donor side. And uh, they trusted us. A year later, before that first 2005 race, 10 days before race day, we had 100 people sign up. We had 300 volunteers <laughs> to support 100 runners. Now that is customer service. <laughs> Three people running beside you. Would you like a goo? Here's your Gatorade. Can I wipe your brow? Scared to death that we were going to fall on our face. 
Uh, but fortunately, those last 10 days in race morning, we ended up with uh, 1,900 people in the inaugural year. Uh, we were able to give away 132,000 to some wonderful nonprofits that help needy families. And we went from 1,900 to 3,200 to 6,200. The last six years in a row, we have been the largest timed Thanksgiving Day run in the world. Uh, not bad, not bad. Um, in the universe, is, some yeah, would say. Exactly, Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the galaxy. <laughs> but we, didn't want, we don't want to be the largest, we want to be the most generous. And so, yes, we're, we're, able to, uh, we're able to donate about a, a million dollars a year now to people in this region, hundreds of thousands of folks who are not nearly as blessed as each of us here with the basics around housing and food and uh, health care uh, through five great nonprofit beneficiaries. And, you know, could I have made some calls and raised a million a year from really generous people in this valley and give it to those charities? Yes. But that doesn't build community. And the whole point of the Turkey Trot and our Santa Run Silicon Valley and our uh, Heart and Soul Salad Bars for Schools run that our foundation uh, owns and directs all three is, yeah, let's help people in need, but let's do it by building community. And when you have 25,000 people in downtown San Jose on race day, on Thanksgiving morning, a day of thanks, you just get goosebumps. I'm glad you told me it's about building community because I thought that Heart and Souls Run was about getting me into a giant asparagus suit. This is what he did about three years ago. Uh, but you mentioned housing. Uh, you founded uh, an organization called the Silicon Valley Housing Trust more than two decades ago. Uh, that housing trust uh, has leveraged more than a quarter billion dollars, uh, helped more than 25,000 families find a home in this valley. We all know we've got a housing crisis. Imagine how much worse it would be without the housing trust. Uh, how did that come to be? Yeah, that's um, through crisis, you find opportunity, right? Um, we started looking into how do we address the housing crisis. And we found out at that time, there were 275 communities across our country that had housing trusts. And they were all funded through taxes and fees. And we weren't against that concept, but we pulled and our community, even though there was a housing crisis, didn't want to pay a new tax or a new fee to fund those housing solutions. Uh, and so we tried it through voluntary contributions. And, and there's the next contribution. We got, we got a donor. Yes. Uh, and, and it was kind of fascinating too, because we gave ourselves 24 months to raise the initial $20 million. And the doubters amongst us, I remember someone coming in and saying, $20 million sounds like two homes in Los Altos Hills. And probably right. But it was a leverage model. And the leverage model of a third, a third, a third, people who are homeless or at risk of becoming so, people who need just a decent, affordable rental home, and first-time home buyers. Everyone from people who work in our companies to school teachers and others that are just so important to our society. So that was the spectrum of need that our housing trust was going to try to meet. And we had 24 months to raise $20 million. 12 months into the 24 months, the dot-com boom busted. And uh, we kept our heads down and knew there were a lot of generous folks in this valley. And 24 months later, August 1st, 2001, we did not achieve 20 million, we achieved 20.6 million. Uh, mm -hmm. The original goal was 200, uh, 20 million would leverage 200 million and we'd be able to help 4,800 families. Uh, to date, our housing trust has been able to secure 250 million in voluntary contributions, leveraging 2.3 billion in private development and helping 27,000 families afford the Sycos Valley. That's great, huh? yeah. That's good. We, we, we had to be willing to fail, uh, not at an executive level, because our executives totally got it, bought in and contributed. But we had someone at, at a member company at a non-executive level, and this will inspire you. John Thompson, tell me if you can relate to this. She said, this is going to be known as the greatest failure in the history of the Silicon Valley leadership group. <laughs> oh, geez. Which made me think, well, what were the other failures that you're referring to? <laughs> 
But you know that you can be motivated by folks who are cheering you on and pushing you forward. And you can be motivated by people who are trying to push you down and let both of them motivate you. Truly, yeah, truly. So we're gonna to return to your work in a moment, but uh, it's okay to applaud. Uh, but I wanna talk about you as a person for a moment. Uh, one of the things I admire so greatly about you is how devoted you are as a parent. And you have three beautiful children, uh, Jessica, Sienna, and Jake. Uh, two of those children are adopted. And you and Leslie made that decision, even though I'm pretty sure you're both pretty busy people. Uh, and for those who don't know, they're both triathletes. And if you haven't gotten an email from either one of them at four in the morning, uh, <laughs> then let me tell you, they're both very busy people uh, who work lots of hours. Uh, but you committed yourself to raising a family and you are passionate about being there for your kids. Tell us about where that comes from, your commitment to your parenthood. Yeah. You know, in life, sometimes you have a choice between being uh, bitter or better. Um, uh, our first daughter uh, just started high school. Uh, she was born the old fa fashioned way to folks who were married and were really attracted to each other. And that's <laughs> Jessica. And um, uh, several years later, um, uh, we were expecting a son and went in for a routine ultrasound. and. Um, the doctor came in and said, uh, your son Emmanuel has numerous and severe abnormalities um, with a condition called trisomy 18 mm -hmm. and uh, would only survive a day or two outside of the womb. Uh, and that was February 7th, 2008, uh, by far the toughest day so far uh, of our lives. Uh, and we lost Emmanuel. Um, and so we had a choice to make, um, you know, and sometimes uh, in our faith, if God closes the door, you, you build a new door. And uh, we decided we wanted um, to add to our family. Uh, so Leslie got to work in that amazing way she does and uh, went on YouTube and I, th I think at the time MySpace and all kinds of stuff <laughs> and started advertising. And I was giving a speech uh, for City Year, uh, a great organization that Tony Burke and others helped launch here in San Jose. And uh, my chest started to vibrate and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack during the speech. And it was my phone vibrating. <laughs> in my pocket. I came off stage and Leslie said, there's a, a really brave teenage girl uh, in, in high school in a small town in Utah who uh, said if we can fly out tomorrow, uh, the baby that was just born a couple hours ago might be ours. So we, um, uh, we had a race in the morning, a triathlon, so we raced and then went to the airport <laughs> uh, and uh, walked into a hospital room. That part is true, by the way, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we, you know, we had like 20 minutes to name this new child and we'd just gotten back from a cycling trip in the Tuscan Hills. And, um, and so we picked the name Sienna. Uh, she's lucky that we weren't in you know, Budapest at the time. <laughs> it wouldn't be quite as good of a name. Uh, but um, you know, Sienna, we would have never had the opportunity to have that baby at one day old. Um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then Jake, um, we heard a presentation on foster children and um, the plight of uh, way too many foster kids in our nation uh, and the outcomes, which are tragic. Great kids, great kids who uh, life has dealt some really hard blows. And uh, so we had an opportunity uh, during uh, our 2016 Measure B traffic relief campaign uh, to foster adopt a little guy at three months old, uh, Jacob Zachary, Jake to his friends. Uh, he mm -hmm. turned three last week and... Uh, Mayor San Jose is his godfather, um, <laughs> but he's not the kind of godfather who's going to put a horse's head in his bed, so it's pretty sad. Sicilian, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you know, you build family. Uh, you build family in all that we do, and we built family through uh, traditional ways, adoption and foster adoption. And I haven't told Leslie yet, but I'm going to adopt Bill Gates later. <laughs> Just with the remaining uh, few few moments we have, Carl, uh, you've been working for not a little bit of time 
on helping to improve the transit system <laughs> in our valley. Uh, and that's actually how- <laughs> Not doing a very good job. <laughs> <am I? laughs> well, actually, in a few months, we're about to celebrate something. Why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, and, and that's great, because it also it starts our story of how we met and became friends. It, it's been about a 50 year dream of this region that we would have rapid rail around the bay. And that should have been BART from the beginning. Uh, but San Mateo County and then Santa Clara County opted out of being part of that BART system. But some of us who weren't even born when that decision was initially made uh, still envision a world-class integrated seamless transit system that we think Bay Area residents deserve. So in year 2000, Mayor of San Jose at the time, Ron Gonzalez, uh, and the leadership group uh, came together and said, let's change that. And uh, we had a chance of leading a ballot initiative to fund uh, the first 10 miles of a 16-mile extension of BART from Fremont, uh, uh, first 10 miles, two stations, Milpitas in the North San Jose neighborhood of Berryessa. And that's where I met then um, private citizen, Sam Licardo, he walked into a campaign office. Skip all office. that part. Let's no, go to the good no. part. Walked yeah. into the campaign office, introduced himself, offered to volunteer, worked 80 to 100 hours a week for four months, along with the rest of us. Uh, we're going to change his name to Bart Licardo. By the way. <laughs> uh, but four campaigns later, all successful, 2000 for the first 10 miles of capital, 2008 in the heart of the downturn of 08 through 010 downturn. Uh, the money to operate what we build, 2016, the money, the local money for the final uh, 6.1 miles. So that first 10 miles is going to open in time to open up on Christmas morning, $100 million under budget. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Guardino. Thank you.